Silent Night, <clears throat> wonderful thought for us to think about of when Jesus came to this earth. But we also, as we look at what Jesus did for us to come to this earth, why did he do it? We think of the end of the world. Yeah, the ripening of earth's harvest. In Mark chapter 4, verse 26 through 29, it describes the king of heaven. Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 29. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into gr the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth of herself, First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Here it describes the kingdom of God. If you look at the whole picture of the kingdom of God, it is describing not only the end event, but it describes the entire process. And the process is described... Uh, basically as agriculture, uh, when you're looking at the agricultural work in the earth. Now, when we think of the very end, the actual harvest, we often think about what has to happen in order to get to that. In Mark 24, sorry, Matthew 24, verse 14, it says, And the gospel, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached where? In all the world. For a witness unto all nations, and then what? Shall the then shall the end come. What does that mean? Does that mean as soon as the gospel is preached in all the world, the end will come? Is that what it means? Now, a lot of times people think about that. They, they, they think that that is the end goal. So we need to do what? We need to preach the gospel everywhere. We need to make sure that the gospel goes to all the world. But look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Quite interesting about this. It says, For the... Hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in, where? In all the world. So has the gospel ever been preached in all the world? According to Apostle Paul, yes. He says, he can say, he can write, when he is writing to the Colossians, he can say, yes, the gospel has been preached, where? Did Jesus come? No, why not? Well, let's evaluate this a little bit more here. You know, um, well, another thing I heard is sometimes people tell me the world is not wicked enough yet. <laughs> the world, the, the, the depending is on how wicked the world is going to be. And you can read Luke chapter 17, and uh, here it talks about as in the days of Noah. It also talks about as the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we... A look at the signs of the times and we can tick things off. Yes, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. But, you know, the Roman Empire, if you look at Romans chapter 1, the description that Paul gives of what the Roman Empire is like, it was pretty wicked. A lot of things that are happening today are simply a repetition of what was in the past. So, why hasn't Jesus come yet? You know, we, we hear, the last couple of weeks I've been bombarded with all sorts of videos and everything else about the coming of Christ. One has the coming of Christ or the uh, end of, what, probation supposed to be next year. Another one has uh, that something where the Muslims began with the... the, the uh, that was the beginning date, was with the falling of the Twin Towers in New York and everything else. And somehow it seems that um, in all of this, people are missing something. Because, you know, over the years, I remember when I first gave my heart to the Lord, I remember there was this guy, he uh, converted from um, witchcraft. He was supposed to be some guy. And they were uh, purporting at that time that Christ was going to come the next year. And it seems like every single year since I began my ministry, every single year I hear Christ is coming next year. 
Every single year. And one of these years, I tell the one guy, one of these years, you're going to be right. <laughs> one of these times, you're going to be right. But do you know something? As we look to that, and, and, and of course, people get complacent. When I first moved to Maryland, the, the thing was the Jubilee was coming the next year. You know, and I asked the guy in the, in the study, I asked him, and what happens if he doesn't come? He says, this is not going to happen again like this for another thousand years. Said, wow. You know, the, the problem that I find is that when we're looking at whether it is next year or next two years or five years, the fact is many people will not finish today. Many people are going to die today. Yeah, you don't know when you're going to die. You have no idea what's going to happen to you. Whether you're going to get shot, and this happens a lot lately. People go to work, and all of a sudden, that's the end of their day. Others, they had a heart attack, massive heart attack, and they die. We don't know what it is, car accidents. Airplanes fall out of the sky. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things. And... You know, when if that happens to me today, that coming has happened today. And if I put it off for another year or whatever else, I'm not going to be ready. So I want to look at the focal point here, because when we look at the time of harvest, sometimes we have forgotten something. When does the harvest take place? This is the key. And notice, going back to Mark chapter 4, verse 29, but when the fruit is brought forth, or in other words, when it is what? Ripe. Ripe, as you see in the margin. As soon as the fruit is brought forth, what happens? Immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest is come. You know, you look at people, I know they're in Australia, they have, we have some brethren in the church, they're farmers. Uh, they have corn, soybeans, nowadays it's cotton. But <laughs> different things. And it's interesting, as they go out there, when they're going to harvest, guess what they do? They go and measure the moisture content of those things. Because they want to measure exactly as soon as the harvest is, as soon as the thing is ripe, what do they do? They got to harvest it immediately because if the rain comes, you're in trouble. I remember I was living in Northern California in the middle of all the rice fields. And uh, <clears throat> some years... They didn't harvest it on time, and right afterwards, the rain came and the wind came, and then you see the rice all laying down, and it's such a pain to harvest then. I want you to pay attention. The focus here is not how bad the world becomes. It's not the timing of events. What is it? When the fruit is ripe. That's the focus point. And when you're growing up on a farm, I grew up on a farm, and everything in your entire life is dependent and is focused on the harvest. There's a lot of other things happening around, but what you're thinking about, you're thinking of the harvest. And when it's time to harvest, what do you do? Forget everything. Everything else has nothing to do with life but harvest. Because without the harvest, you have no food, you have no money, you have nothing. And the focus point, because remember the verse here that we read in the beginning, the kingdom of heaven is like this. Like what? Like harvesting. And the focus of all that is? The fruit is ripe. So doesn't, so the, the second, the a proclamation of the gospel to the world, actually that is secondary. <laughs> it's actually secondary. Because what about us? You know, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, when we talk about ripening of earth's harvest, what does it say here? Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. I want you to pay attention here. 
when we're talking about ripeness of harvest, what are we talking about? We are talking about a character like Jesus Christ. That means if we are thinking about harvest, we're, if we're thinking about the second coming of Christ, the end of the world, we have to correlate that to character. We can't forget character out of all these things. Yeah, the other issues are important. Yes, I understand the importance to preach the gospel. I understand the condition of the world. We have to be aware of what's happening around us in society. But that is not the primary issue in relationship to the harvest. So what is it waiting for? Why is Jesus not here? We can ask the other question, when is Jesus going to come? In Ephesians 5, verse 27, it says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, here's an interesting verse. I want you to pay attention to this verse. It does not say that he may present to himself only individuals. What does it say here? He's going to present to himself a church. That means that when Jesus comes again the second time, there is going to be a church without spot, without wrinkle, <clears throat> but it's going to be holy and without blemish. For this reason... Christ Objects Lessons, page 69. After quoting the verses there in Mark, it says, Christ is, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself where? In his church. And listen carefully. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Why? The harvest is ripe. And as soon as the harvest is ripe, you don't wait. <clears throat> if the harvest is not ripe, what do you have to do? You're going to have to wait patiently. So the focal point here in reality is character development. And as a result of character. What's going to happen? It goes on the next page. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for but to hasten. hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to pay attention here. If we want to hasten the coming of Christ, it's actually in our power to do that. Not because we have power, but it's talking here about surrender. You and I, if we surrender, not next year, not a couple years from now, but right now, if we surrender. It says, we're all who profess his name, bearing fruit to his glory. How quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. <coughs> if we are bearing fruit, it'll all come to an end. And when we're talking about fruit bearing, what are we talking about? And so many times we associate fruit bearing with evangelism. Yeah, we, we think of fruit bearing. When we think of a, a harvest, we're thinking of baptisms. And it's important to have baptisms. <coughs> but when we're talking in this context here of fruit bearing, we're all bearing fruit. There was one fruit mentioned in the Bible. You find that in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit 
of the Spirit is what? Evangelism? It will result in evangelism. Don't misunderstand me. I really believe in the importance of evangelism. But evangelism without fruit. Yeah, you can have a baptism without fruit. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That's the fruit. In other words, when we're talking about fruit, it's the change of character. Amen. It's the change of our nature. That's what we're talking about. And without the change of nature, you can talk all you want. You can evangelize. You can prophesy. You can do all those things. And it's not bearing fruit. And the natural result, now keep in mind, when, when we have this experience, when we have the fruit, in volume 5 it says, not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy the defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples of the day of Pentecost. When we bear fruit, then we receive the latter rain. And then what does that mean? That means you have effective evangelism. <laughs> Not just evangelism, but effective evangelism. Where people's natures are changed. Well, let's talk a little bit about this readiness. And somehow we lose focus on this sometimes. And, and it's important to bring it back to this, especially in relationship to 1 John 3, verse 2, becoming like him. In Revelation chapter 14, because this is the message that we have for the last days, verses 1 and verse 4, it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having the Father's name, written in their foreheads. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. So here it describes a group of people called the 144,000. After quoting these verses, in Acts of the Apostles, it says, In holy vision the prophet saw the ultimate triumph of God's remnant church. And we hear a lot about the remnant, the remnant church and all these things. Well, the ultimate triumph of God's remnant church is the 144,000. And this is why it's really important for us in looking at the second coming of Christ and talking about character that we need to look at this group of people because that's the ultimate triumph. It's the ultimate end. That is it. Okay? So, therefore, if, if that's it, then, and, and these are the people that will be alive when Jesus comes the second time, then... We need to have that character of those who are sealed to be there, to be ready. So I'm just going to look at some characteristics. We're not going to spend a, a we're not going to go be exhaustive here at all, but I just want to touch on some of the characteristics that we need to have in order to be there, to be ready. One of the things is the sensitivity toward sin. In Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4, and this gives a description very similar to Revelation 7 of the sealing work there. It says, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So why are they sighing and crying? Why? In other words, sensitivity. 
they, are, they, they, they sense sin very quickly. Whose sin do they sense? Oh, this is what we forget. And I find a lot of people are very eager to talk about everybody else's sins. And when I travel around, I, I just, it just bothers me. I, people want to sit there and tell me what they're seeing in the church and what the sins they're seeing. And when they get upset with me because I start turning it back to them and they're not very happy to hear about that part. Because notice here, because you know, we, we like to evaluate other people, okay? You know, but it says here in volume five, the class who do not feel grieved over what? Their own spiritual declension, nor mourn over the sins of others will be left without the seal of God. Because to be effective, we have to recognize our need first. You know, we, we, we want to talk about reformation of everybody else. It's so easy to talk about how you need to change. But what we find here that the real sensitivity towards sin has to be in ourselves personally. And we need to be praying for that. And you know, we discussed in the Sabbath school lesson a little bit about reproof. Reproof is not easy. As a matter of fact, reproof is the very difficult thing. Nobody, nobody likes reproof. You know, you learn to deal with it, but nobody loves, says, wow, well, give me another one. <laughs> no, that's not a fact, okay? But that's not how we react. Okay, but if you want to avoid reproof, yes, there's a way to avoid reproof. How do you avoid reproof? Don't mess up. <laughs> okay, so if you don't mess up, okay, we, we, but when we mess up, how do you avoid reproof? That's the point. And this is why here it says they're grieved over their own spiritual declension. If I can sense my need, you know, if you're going to go through and identify your particular needs first, then it's not so much necessary for outside reproof. But if you're disregarding it, then what does the Lord send you? Help. He sends you help, which is chastisement. That's not very nice. So here, the first thing here, when we're talking about preparing for the second coming of Christ, it's the sensitivity to what is sin, first of all and foremost, is our own. That's what we need to see. And then, of course, as well with others. It does have that aspect to it. Now, on the opposite side, you know, volume 5, it goes on. Here we see the church, the Lord's sanctuary, was the first to feel the stroke of the wrath of God. The ancient men those to whom God had given great light and had stood as guardians of the spiritual interests of the people had betrayed their trust. They had taken the position that we need not look for miracles and the marked manifestation of God's power as in former days. Times have changed. These words strengthen their unbelief and they say the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. He is too merciful to visit his people in judgment. Thus, peace and safety is the cry from men who will never again lift up their voice like a trumpet to show God's people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Why do these leaders refuse to, to stand up for sin? Why is it that they are afraid to reprove sin? Why? Why? <laughs> you got it there. You see, because when you reprove and, 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 and you have your own hanging in there, <coughs> you know, and people that are getting reproved, some people who don't like reproof, what do they do? Oh, but you have this. Why don't you take care of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't that happening? And you want to avoid that, so what do you do? Little by little, you start, stop reproving and everything is peace and safety. You see, we got to look at ourselves. We have to have changes. Change is not easy. It's hard to move. It's hard to do. There's so many things. We don't like change. We don't like to go to a new job. We don't like anything new. You know, that's why we get stuck in our rut. And that's why God helps us a little bit by shaking things up a little bit here. What about our relationship towards things of the world? 
James 4, verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship with the world is what? Enmity. Enmity towards God. Do you love God? So what happens? The more and more you have a deeper love for God, what happens? Yeah, there's a, there, there's, there, the, the things of the world do not impress you anymore. And why is it then, why is it that we struggle both individually and as a church with worldliness? Why is that the big struggle? Do you know why? What happens when you are adapting towards the world and becoming more like it? What happens? What are you preparing for in reality? In volume 5 again it says, What are you doing, brethren, in the great work of preparation? <clears throat> Those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly mold and preparing for the mark of the beast. Yeah. Oh, everybody's worried about the mark of the beast. The, mark, the beast is simply worldliness. Yeah. That's all it is. It's taking the world above God. It's simple as that. <clears throat> and so when we, we may be fear, oh, oh, the Sabbath Sunday issue, and we like to study about those prophecies. And, and don't misunderstand me, I love prophecy. Those of you who know me, I love studying prophecy, I love teaching prophecy, I love dates, I love all those things. But you know, if we're missing the point of all the prophecies, you know, and somebody, some people, they, 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 they study the prophecies and by the time they're done, they're terrified of everything in the world. And they're running away, they're, they're looking for a beast around every nook and cranny in the world. And they're terrified. And at the same time, they're getting ready for the mark of the beast by preparing, by becoming worldly. God wants, this is why when, when we're talking about change of nature, that's what we're talking about. God is looking at changing our whole, whole attitude of life. That's why the fruit of the Spirit is not just telling people about the beast. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is having a change in your life. And then when you talk about the beasts and all those things, it is an avenue to help people to wake up and not get terrified, but actually to have a change in their character. And now we've got to talk about consistency as well. Matthew chapter 23 talks about the Pharisees. And how many times <clears throat> when we discuss Pharisaism, <clears throat> People think it's people that are very sticklers for the exactness and fulfilling the law of God. And in reality, Pharisaism, as you look at it, is not sticklers for themselves. They're sticklers for you. Yeah, they're sticklers to make sure that you are following the law. But that's why Jesus, in Matthew 23, discussing about the Pharisees, I'm just putting up verse 3 here, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, and by the way, that's when they sit in Moses' seat, not all their other foolishness, but when they're teaching you from the law of God, that observe and do, but do ye not after their works, for why? Say. They say and do not. They have rules, and they come up with rules. And sometimes I find people, they come up with such stringent rules. And when I tell them, that's impossible to keep. Oh no, we got to enforce this. And we got to make rules to enforce ourselves to enforce these rules. Now, that's even worse. Okay, if you don't enforce the rules, you must be punished. Why? And then the rules become impossible to bear. And that's why, don't, don't do what they, do, what they tell you. I mean, you do what they tell you when they, and again, only when. When they're sitting in Moses' seat. Okay, but their problem is inconsistency. And this is why. Again, volume 5. Not all who profess to keep the Sabbath will be sealed. Why? There are many even among those who teach the truth to others who will not receive the seal of God in their foreheads. They had the light of truth. They knew their master's will. They understood every point of our faith. But they had not what? Not corresponding. In other words, inconsistency. They could teach it. You can ask them everything. Those who were so familiar with prophecy and the treasure of divine wisdom should have acted their faith. That's a tough thing when you're, you're teaching something to someone else. And I remember uh, I was going to school one day and um, 
in junior high school and we were walking all the on our way to school and a friend of mine began asking me what Christianity is and he asked me all these questions. You know, and one time he asked me, he says, is it wrong to curse and swear? And I said, absolutely it's wrong. The Christian doesn't do that. And then he asked me, then why do you curse and swear? <laughs> and I said, because I'm not a Christian. It's simple, I'm not a Christian. You know, it led me a few weeks later to come and give my heart to the Lord, and then I became a Christian. It did change my life. But you know, can you imagine people who are teaching and doing one thing and, and living the opposite? It has a dangerous effect. You know, thankfully to me, I mean, I knew the truth. I mean, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it was right and wrong. You asked me a question, I could give you the answer. Sure, but it was not in my heart at all. And that's why when we're when we're talking about evangelism, the biggest failure in evangelism is inconsistency. You know, people hear the truth, they come, and they find something completely different in the church than what they heard in the evangelistic meetings. That's the biggest difficulty. And this is why when we're looking at at this whole picture here, going back to the power for witnessing, because the power for witnessing in the last days is going to be the latter rain. And here's what it says, not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have what? One spot or stain upon them. Remember, we read that in Ephesians, isn't it? That's what he's preparing, a people that are going to be like this. It is left with us to remedy the defects in our character, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. In other words, character first. God is looking for a character. He is looking for fruit. <laughs> See, that's what he's looking for. And when the fruit is ready, that's when the harvest time is come. And so, and then of course, for us to finish the whole harvest, we need to have the power of the latter rain. And that power is not going to happen uh, until we have a change in character. In, uh, it compares it to the early church. And if you read in Acts chapter 2, starts with verse 1, they were all of one accord. All of one accord. And this is why. Notice that it was after the disciples had come into what? Perfect unity when they were no longer striving for the highest place that the Spirit was poured out. They were all of one accord. All differences had been put away. Then it was that the Holy Spirit was poured out and thousands were converted in the day. And of course, the next sentence there, so it may be now. It may be the same thing. God hasn't changed. Nothing has changed in the plan of redemption, but maybe we have changed. So what we need to understand is we need to change. <laughs> yeah? We need to do that thing which is uncomfortable, that which is not normal. We don't like change. We like, we like everything. That's why we tend to be conservatives. You know, uh, Christians have a tendency to be conservative. Why? They don't like change. And God wants, that's why God doesn't want conservative Christians. Absolutely not. Because we need to change. Okay, there needs to be a change. That doesn't mean, it, that doesn't mean he wants liberal ones either. Okay, what he wants is Christians, Christians who accept the changes necessary in their life. Now, when we're talking about unity, we're not talking about ecumenism. We're not talking about ecumenical, whether we're comparing it inside or outside of Adventism, it doesn't matter. God's not looking for ecumenical type of unity. Matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, Jesus says, Think not I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Wow. And yet you read the passages, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Okay? And yet at the same time, he says, I did not come to bring peace. So how do we understand this? On one hand, there is peace. On the other hand, he says, I bring a sword. You see, uh, it's really important to understand this. Christ declared, I came not to send peace, but a sword. Why? Because men would not receive the word of life. And what happens when men rec don't receive the word of life? Because they warred against the message sent them to bring them joy and hope and life. So he brings us a message that brings peace. But when you reject that message, what happens? War. It creates war in you. Okay, there is a conflict. And so when we're looking at unity, because we want to see unity, 
we're eager for unity. But at the same time, the message brings in separation. And notice Revelation 14, verse 4. We read this at the very beginning. It says here, these are they which are not defiled with women. This is speaking of that group, the 144,000, the ultimate triumph of God's remnant church. Okay, they're not defiled with women. Now, women in the Bible represent a church. A pure church, you know, well, you're not going to be defiled with a pure church. Okay, a pure woman remains pure. Therefore, this must be speaking of apostate churches. So, when it says they're not defiled with women, does that mean they were never a part of an apostate church? Notice in Revelation 18, 4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her who? My people. And the context here is Babylon in the previous verses. Come out of her, my people. Where are they? They're in Babylon. Who's in Babylon? God's people. God's people. And it says, notice here, that ye may not be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. That means they're in Babylon, but they are not defiled by Babylon. That's an amazing thing here. Yeah, because they are not what? Partakers of her sins. But what, if the, what happens if the message comes, come out, and they stay there? That's another story, you see. This is why the message says, come out, and then when you come out, then you don't partake of her uh, sins. In Bible commentary, it says, The angel with the writer's inkhorn is to place a mark upon the foreheads of all who are what? Separated from sin and sinners, and the destroying angel follows this angel. That means there has to be a separation from those who choose to go into sin. So the big question comes is because unity is really important. God wants his people to unify. But the question is, are we to unify at all costs? See, see this is the question. You see, because, because ecumenism is looking at unity at all costs. So you're prepared to surrender whatever is necessary in order to have unity. But it's interesting here, the statement here, it says we are to unify, but not on the platform of error. That's really important here. So, yes, we are eager to meet with people. We're eager to unify. But we cannot unify on a platform of error. And another very important perspective, and this is sometimes, you know, when we, we're dealing with, with problems, whether we're in the problems in the church, problems in marriages. And I, 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 I mean, I, there's a statement that really bothers me. And it bothers me. The more I hear it, the more it bothers me. And people keep saying, you need to forgive and forget. Now, I understand we need to forgive, okay? Christ forgave. Uh, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The, the attitude of forgiveness we must have. But what about forgetting? You know, we need to look at this. You see, when we're talking about unity, and, and, and I, I hear this a lot, um, I, I've been dealing with quite a few people that were in marriages that broke up. And uh, one of the partners were, was abusive. And it's interesting how Christians keep telling the one who's being abused, you need to forgive and, and forget. <laughs> in other words, go back into that. And it's like, that, that's, not, that's not biblical. You know, that, that's, I can't accept that. And this is why it says here, there should be no union until what? Change. There's a change. No union until there's a change. So the attitude of forgiveness must be there. So yes, that must always happen. We must have, when Christ gave the example, Father, forgive them. Why? For they know not what they do. Did he tell that to Caiaphas? Sure he did. All those, they were, he said, Father, forgive them, why? For they know not what they do. Now, the question is, after the resurrection, did he go and say to Caiaphas, hello, buddy? <laughs> did he go that? Matter of fact, he never went to meet Caiaphas again. He says, the next time you see me, you'll be coming in the clouds of heaven. 
and you're going to see some terrible things at that point. Okay, but it was their decision. So the disciples, so Judas, did he go in after the crucifixion, res resurrection, did he come and resurrect Judas and say, hey, buddy? No, but he said that to Peter. Why did he, why did he come and meet with Peter? Why did he say after the resurrection, okay, go to, I want to meet the disciples, but don't forget to tell Peter I need to meet him. Why? Because there was something that happened. There was a change. And we have to see changes in order to have unity, whether it's in the home, whether it's in the church. So we're looking at making sure that there's no platform of error that we're uniting on. At the same time, there has to be changes that we see. And when we give our heart to the Lord, there are changes in, in our life experience. <clears throat> now, now, one of the biggest problems that we find in Christianity is found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. And probably when we look at a lot of these issues over the years, and like I said, every year, I usually, years, sometimes it waits two years, maybe three years, but in my nearly 40 years of ministry, it has been, um, <clears throat> every year there's been the coming of Christ is next year or close of probation. It's been every single year. I mean, I'm, you just get tired of that, okay? But the problem with that is that it breeds something. And Revelation 3.16, So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. It breeds lukewarmness. It breeds complacency. <clears throat> and people sit back and, and, they, and they, they think that they're going, to, they're going to live again. You know, and I remember when we were building the uh, church there in Shahola. <laughs> Um, I remember uh, I was out in California, <clears throat> and they, 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 some of the brethren came there, and one of them borrowed one of my tools, and he broke it, and he says, look, he left me a note, he says, I'll, I'll give it back to you in Earth Main, yeah. And we laughed about it, you know, it was kind of funny, you know, <clears throat> and whatnot. And he went in, to Europe on a vacation with his family, and as soon as he landed in Europe, uh, they landed in Frankfurt, Germany, they were driving back to Croatia, and that night, all four of them were killed in a car accident. And you know, I, I, I'd thrown away the note. I wish I kept it, you know, because it was really prophetic in that sense. But I know it was just written as a joke, but at the same time, how many times are we, you know, all four, the, 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 the parents and their two children, they were just teenagers. You know, we don't have tomorrow. Tomorrow is not ours. And we're getting in a lukewarm complacency. That's our problem with either these messages or anything else. That's our danger. And this is why the great mass of professing Christians will meet with bitter disappointment in the day of God. They have not upon their foreheads the seal of the living God. Lukewarm and half-hearted, they dishonor God far more than the avowed unbeliever. Yeah, we dis uh, dishonor God more than the uh, unbeliever because we're half-hearted. Are you half-hearted in the message that you are doing. <clears throat> and then what about purity? Revelation 21, 27. In, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You know, when we look at this, this whole issue of purity, <clears throat> Testament ministers, will the seal be put upon the impure in mind, the fornicator, the adulterer, the man who covets his neighbor's wife? You know, we're talking about purity. We're discussing here about a change of nature, a change of our character. <clears throat> and what about our diet? You know, how does it affect our diet? It says, grains and fruits prepared free from grease and in as natural a condition as possible should be the food for the table of all who claim to be preparing for translation to heaven. You know, so purity of mind, purity of body, these are all interrelated. And this is why all of this has an effect upon us. <clears throat> Doctrinal purity. We look at the early Christian church. They were very clear on their doctrinal purity. It's interesting that in Great Conrad says the early Christians were indeed a peculiar people. Their blameless deportment. What does blameless mean? They couldn't find fault. Couldn't find fault in them and unswerving faith were a continual reproof that disturbed the sinner's peace. Though few in numbers without wealth, position, or honorary titles, they were a terror to evildoers wherever what was known? The character and the doctrine. Character and the doctrine. So they did not have false doctrine, but their characters matched their teachings. 
And that's what made the early Christian church a terror to evildoers. Are evildoers terrified of us? Or are they happy to see us? <laughs> that's a good question here. I'm serious. This is a, something for us to evaluate because we're preparing for the final crisis. And the question is, are we prepared for this? Revelation 14, 5 says, In their mouth was found no guile. What kind of person has no guile? James 3, verse 2, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. What about this issue of perfection? You know, we talked again this morning about our lips, you know, our mouth. Okay, what about that? You know, is there needs, I mean, I'm just giving you an idea, there needs to be a change, brethren. And we focus on a few things only, but we need to change a lot of things. And diet, by the way, has a very important aspect to this. You know, that's why it's so important. When we're talking about perfection of character, we have to talk about a change of diet. That's why our health ministry is so important. It says, those who have received instruction regarding the evils of the use of flesh foods, tea and coffee, and rich in unhealthful food preparations, and who are determined to make a covenant with God by sacrifice, will not continue to indulge their appetite for food that they know to be unhealthful. God demands that the appetites be cleansed and that self-denial be practiced in regard to those things which are not good. Why? Why is this so important? It goes on. This is a work that will have to be done before his people can stand before him a perfected people. It affects our perfection. And that's why, you know, people tell me, oh, it's impossible to be perfect. Of course, the way we're living, yeah. We're making it impossible. We're, do, we're doing more and more things to make it impossible for us to prepare for eternity. And then we want to talk about the second coming of Christ. And then we want to set deadlines. You know, our deadline is right now. You know, our deadline is, 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 is right here. And, and why is that? Because, you know, it says here, just as soon as God's people are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. You know, what we're talking about here is settling in the truth. Why is settling in the truth so important? Because God does not want to have sin again come again in this universe. God is not interested in this whole thing repeating itself. And so to avoid that, we need to be what? Settled. And that's what sealing is all about. Again, as wax takes the impression of the seal, so the soul is to take the impression of the Spirit of God and retain the image of Christ. In other words, what God is looking for is a people for all eternity to actually retain the image of Christ. Not changeable. And all of these things that we talked about have an effect on how it affects us for eternity. Are you preparing to be settled? in the truth? Or are you looking for something else? Mark chapter 4, verse 29. Let's go back to our key text we mentioned a few times here again. But when the fruit is brought forth, in other words, what? It is ripe. Immediately put it in the sickle because the harvest has come. The question for you is, have you surrendered your heart to the Lord to such an extent that you are actually bearing fruit? It doesn't say when it's planning on bearing fruit. It's when the fruit is ripe. Is your character ripe for eternity? I want to leave you with one last thought here. Let us strive with all the power that God has given us to be among the 144,000. Why? Because it's talking about character. That's what it's talking about. And don't put it off for another time. Today, right now, are you ripe for the harvest? May the Lord help us that today we may make a decision, that we may make a choice to surrender ourselves fully to the Lord is my prayer. Amen. Amen. Amen.